Professor Noam Chomsky is one of the most cited scholars in history and among the best known public intellectuals in the world today. He has authored more than 100 books. Most recently released is Chomsky for Activists, a hopeful collection of interviews and commentaries that helps put our present moment in historical perspective. And we certainly need that. Hello, Professor Chomsky, and welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Um, your book is quite hopeful, and with your depth of experience and the upsurge in activism, it really is incredibly timely and useful, as it is to hear your own personal experience, your own personal stories as an activist that were in the book. What prompted you to publish these conversations and writings at this time? Well, there's nothing more important today than engaged activism to deal with issues of overwhelming significance. If that, I mean, we can't overlook the fact that we're living at a unique moment of human history. Humans have been on earth for a couple hundred thousand years. We are now, this generation is literally facing the question whether it is going to continue or whether human the human experiment will collapse in an inglorious failure. Mm -hmm. There are many reasons. There's a confluence of problems, urgent problems, uh, uh, the uh, heating of the environment mm -hmm. is the most obvious. You may have seen uh, this morning's newspapers. Mm -hmm. There's a leak, French, New services have a leak from the draft of the upcoming IPCC report, uh, reported in the Washington Post, which is much more grim than even those in the past, and is warning that uh, unless we make fairly radical changes in what we're doing right now, we will soon reach a point, a tipping point where there's nothing more to do. Um, it could be, for example, take one of their cases that the uh, melting of the polar ice caps, which is accelerating, it might reach the point where sea levels might rise maybe 40 feet. That's basically the end. Uh, won't happen tomorrow, but could happen in a generation or two. Hmm. Decisions right now, will determine whether that whether the fate of humans and many other species uh, will persist. And that's not the only case. Uh, the threat of nuclear war is increasing very sharply. Unfortunately, this is bipartisan. The global warming is mostly Republican insanity. But uh, on nuclear war, there's a bipartisan commitment to increase the threats and dangers, not only by provocative actions, which are extraordinarily dangerous, but by creation of new weapon systems, new space command, uh, more means for self-destruction. Uh, we're going to face new pandemics. It's we can be quite confident about that. This one was predicted in 2003 after the end of the SARS, uh, the first SARS uh, uh, epidemic was contained. The right measures weren't taken. If we don't take them now, we'll reach cases where um, so far we've been kind of lucky. The various uh, coronaviruses have either been highly lethal, but not very contagious, like Ebola, or highly contagious, but not terribly lethal, like this one. It's kind of difficult to say not too lethal when 600,000 Americans are dead, but by comparison, which might, what, this might, might, ha might happen and will happen, it's, it's not terribly lethal. The next one may be contagious and lethal, and uh, we can prepare for it. 
but it's barely being done. And we can go on. The destruction of American democracy is moving ahead very rapidly. Uh, and uh, that means that the possibilities of dealing with the crises are receding. The only way to deal with them is through an informed public engaged in understanding and deliberating and finding ways there are ways to overcome the crises. Now there's, there's good news. The good news is that we know how to do it. Mm. The knowledge is there. More good news is that people are working on it. Mm. So for example, uh, there has been progress in the most uh, dangerous parts of the economy. Uh, the worst uh, danger of, we have to eliminate fossil fuels within a couple of decades, but the worst offenders are the coal, is coal. Mm. Trump administration tried to maximize the dangers as part of its general lethal uh, policies, but there has been progress. Recently, the head of the United Mine Workers uh, Cecil Roberts agreed to a program initiated by activists who've been working hard on the issue, a program to shift the mine workers to uh, work on sustainable energy, capping mines, uh, better jobs, better life, saving the environment. Mm. Uh, couple of dozen California uh, unions, an oil-based economy recently agreed to the same thing. Uh, that has to be pushed forward. There are programs which can deal with the problem. In the case of nuclear war, it's perfectly obvious that there are programs. Mm. But these opportunities have to be grasped. Now to get back to your question, it is crucial that activism increase to address these existential issues and many others. Uh, Professor Chomsky, as we near what you called the, and what a, is, is actively known to be the total destruction of the planet, how do you see activism playing out? Uh, are different issue group, interest groups more likely to coalesce around the intersections of all the different issues, or will they splinter further outward? What do you, what do you think? Issues are all interconnected, but there are priorities. So let's take destroying the planet. Uh, right now, uh, two uh, people in Congress, Al uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and Ed Markey, have introduced a resolution in Congress, which is a very detailed program for dealing with the crisis of global warming, a sensible version of a Green New Deal. It's very similar to the programs uh, proposed by the International Energy Association by leading economists who've worked on the issue, primarily my co-author Robert Pollan, who's been in the lead on this. Now that's not a, that's not legislation, it's a resolution. That's a big step forward. Mm. And it's the result of intensive activism. You can trace it back to the work of groups like Sunrise Movement, which uh, where their activist work reached to the level of occupying congressional offices, got a little support from the uh, representatives who came in on the Sanders wave, primarily AOC, Ed Markey in the Senate. Instead of being thrown out, they were, uh, their proposals were entertained, went on with further pressures to uh, the point where there is by now a resolution has to be moved to legislation. That's the next step. Then it has to be implemented. But these are the successive steps that have to be taken 
if we are going to save the planet, just like the work that was done to energize the unions to adopt programs which will expedite the termination of the destructive fossil fuel economy. All of these things can be done. Uh, they have to be done. Mm. And it is, we can actually trace it back to the work of mostly young people who are on the front lines in this. Professor Chomsky, the age old question of working from within the system versus we're working from without came up again recently from members of the Sunrise Movement, um, who, as you mentioned, made some inroads thanks to the Bernie wave. Um, some in the group feel that continuing their direct action techniques could jeopardize these inroads, their standing. Do you believe it's possible to maintain intrasystem influence and take to the streets and, and push from the outside within the same organization? Yeah, lots of histories, just about everything. Take uh, civil rights legislation back in the mid 60s. That was a result of intensive action on the streets finally led to the uh, all, all sorts of, uh, don't have to run through it, we're familiar with it, years of action, dangerous actions when snake workers went in freedom buses through Alabama uh, to try to encourage black farmers to take their lives in their hands and cast a vote, um, suffered themselves, sometimes killed, all sorts of activities when couple of black students in Greensboro, North Carolina, sat in at a segregated lunch counter, mm. were thrown out, arrested, others came. Some came from the North. Pretty soon you had more activism, major demonstrations. Uh, finally, it got to the point of the March on Washington. Other pressures got Lyndon Johnson to push through moderate civil rights legislation, but everything else is the same. Hmm. Take the uh, INF treaty, the, tre the Reagan-Gorbachev treaty to uh, limit very dangerous emplacements of uh, short range missiles, hmm. nuclear missiles in Europe. A real tripwire could have led to global war anytime. Reagan and Gorbachev did uh, reach a treaty which banned the major step forward. Trump dismantled it, okay? And Biden is going along with the dismantling. Uh, but the treaty was signed in 1987, not out of nowhere. That was after the biggest demonstrations in history, actually. Huge anti-nuclear demonstrations on the streets in the early 80s. And uh, it could go through, I mean, you can't find a case where that's not true. Mm. There's an interaction between direct action, legislation, implementation of the legislation, pushing it forward. This is constant. That's the way things happen. Hmm. In terms of tactics, when giving your experience in the six in the sixties in the book, you stressed that the movement and our movement now needs to stay nonviolent. But as we're facing our own extinction, do you believe that there is a place for more extreme forms of resistance? What would the more extreme forms achieve? So suppose uh, we adopt, say, weathermen tactics and uh, go down Main Street, smashing store windows, uh, attacking banks, uh, putting bombs in. Uh, in the various uh, facilities, what would that achieve? Well, it would achieve exactly what it achieved when it was done back in the late 60s, early 70s. Increased support for the Vietnam War led to more right-wing reaction, more repression, uh, escalated the war. In fact, the Vietnamese themselves were pleading with activists not to adopt these tactics. Maybe it makes you feel good, but we don't care if you feel good, we would like to survive. Mm. I was at such meetings, in fact. And the same answer is the case now. Ask what anybody who's carrying out 
any activity with in any serious fashion caring about the victims not whether i feel good i will ask what are the consequences what are the likely consequences of these actions and we know very well from experience and even just logic in a way the violent actions will incite greater violence you move confrontations to the arena of violence those who monopolize violence are going to win okay it's the worst possible tactic we've seen it over and over it's obvious why um, you can't say i mean there might be cases where violence is justified violence in self-defense for example but it's a very it's a pretty remote contingency the actions that have been successful are overwhelmingly non-violent and there's a wide array of them that can be pursued it's difficult takes courage takes a willingness to endure to continue in the face of serious adversity and harm but it's the only way to proceed oh, that seems um more extreme than than what we're having now in terms of resistance in general um even even a general strike that would cause financial hardship um physical hardship for people um say if all of the amazon workers went on strike or if all of our grocery store workers could go on strike um for better conditions for better you know it seems like we could up the ante a little bit without getting violent. Oh, yeah. A general strike might be exactly the right way to deal with the major crisis that we face. But of course, a general strike has a prerequisite. Mm -hmm. People are, the general population is committed to it. We're far from that. You take a look at public opinion studies, it's it's horrifying <laughs> it was a recent the most recent study that i saw on uh, attitudes towards climate change was a study by the pew research institute the main main uh, main institute that studies public attitudes uh, they asked people uh, they gave people a, for, a choice of 15 issues uh, important issues and ask them to rank them in terms of urgency. <laughs> One of them was climate change. Climate change is a euphemism for destruction of the environment. Sounds less dramatic, uh, but uh, that's what it means. Mm. So of the 15, they, they, they divided the responses into people who uh, identify as Democrats and as Republicans among the democrats uh, it wasn't very impressive but at least climate change was considered an urgent problem by a majority among the republicans it was ranked lowest mm. among 15. 15 about 14 percent thought it was an urgent problem well the main problems that they saw were illegal immigration and the federal deficit. Not realizing that immigration is often driven by climate change. Yeah, but the illegal immigration it ranks among urgent problems down so low you can barely find it. The deficit became a problem on November 4th. Mm. As long as Republicans were creating the deficit, it was fine. The line was, uh, Ronald Reagan taught us that deficits don't matter. As soon as, the, as long as you're creating deficits to enrich the very rich and strengthen the corporate sector, like the Trump legislative program tax scam punched a huge hole in the deficit, but that was fine, <laughs> enriching the super rich. But if you create a deficit because it's helping uh, working people and poor people know that and then it's the major problem uh, but the idea of going back to the idea of a general strike should be, should be on the agenda but not when about half the voters 
don't regard it as an issue. There's a huge educational program to be undertaken. Mm. And remember that if you turn to the Republican Party, it's a party of denialists. Every leading figure either denies that what is happening is happening or says it doesn't matter. Now they get the echo chamber in Fox News, which tells them it's a liberal scam, forget it. Mm. Okay? We have a situation where a great large part of the population simply is not living in this world, does not see what is happening. And there's very little discussion of it. There's a lot of discussion of the fact that 70% uh, of Republicans think the election was stolen, which is madness. Mm. They're living in a world of lunacy. Okay, that's bad enough. <laughs> but not seeing that we're racing towards disaster and that Trump's programs backed by the Republican Party were accelerating consciously, purposely accelerating the race to the abyss in order to increase short-term profits for his rich friends. Mm. Unless, talking, I'm sorry, go ahead. Unless people get to understand that, it's not going to be a basis for further actions of the kind like general strikes. Well, I think that's that's why the giant propaganda machine has been so helpful. Just, um, uh, you know, I wonder if you could comment on the fact that activists seem to be caught up in how to convince the other side, um, educate the other side is what you were saying. But in your book, you surprised me by saying that preaching to the choir is actual, actually a useful, good idea. Um, is converting people to a way, one's way of thinking necessary to obtain our movement's goals, or can we move on without the 50% who you believe? can't achieve major goals without public support, unless you want a fascist state, which forces them by violence. Mm. Uh, we don't want that. No, we don't want so that. Therefore, we have to bring the public to comprehend what the issues are and to become engaged in it. And take, say, the civil rights movement. At the, in the early stages, they had very little public support. It finally got to the point where there was enough public support so you could carry out major direct actions and bring about some legislation. Incidentally, never reached substantial public support. So you take a look at uh, Martin Luther King's popularity, never reached anything like a majority of the population. And in fact, as he turned from uh, denouncing racist Alabama sheriffs to moving towards racism in the North and uh, efforts to construct a poor people's movement, support went way down. Northern liberals didn't want to hear that. It's okay to condemn Bull Connor in Alabama, but not in my backyard. Mm -hmm. I don't want a poor people's movement in the North. I don't, I don't and in fact, uh, rather strikingly, the uh, demonstrations after the George Floyd uh, murder were, uh, had a level of public support that was way beyond what King achieved any time during his uh, amazing work, remarkable work, but never reached anything like that popularity. That's the result of extensive educational programs carried out over many years. Mm. Uh, Black Lives Matter, others have just changed awareness and consciousness to the extent that when Floyd was murdered, there was a spontaneous outburst of protest, solidarity, black and white, all kinds of groups of the classes, about two thirds public support. Popular movements almost never reached that. I don't think there's been anything like it in American history. That's the result of constant educational and organizational work on the ground. Uh, 
Professor Chomsky, how have liberals come any farther? Uh, what is the st- uh, what is the status of the issue that you were discussing? That liberals are happy to take up the cause of civil rights, but not so much happy to take up the cause of uh, class rights. Um, you know, Martin Luther, as you said, Martin Luther King, when he wanted to fight for the poor people's movement, then then they weren't with him anymore. Did we did we make any progress? I think we've made progress, slow progress, but things have changed. If you look at the country today and the country, say, in the 1960s, it's very different. Recall that in the 1960s, we still had federal laws requiring segregation in federal housing. Mm. Inexpensive housing was essentially barred to African Americans. That lasted right through the 1960s. Uh, it's not the case now. Uh, we had, uh, in the 1960s, we had anti miscegenation laws that were so extreme that the Nazis refused to accept them. Okay, we don't talk about that anymore. Uh, many other examples, attitudes towards aggression, let's say. It took years of hard work to develop any opposition to the Vietnam War. We tend to forget, but the anti-war movement reached a significant stage by uh, 1967, 1968. By that time, Vietnam had practically been destroyed. Mm. The uh, leading scholar, a Vietnam scholar, uh, Bernard Fall, who was right on the scene, Vietnam scholar, military historian, actually was killed in battle. Uh, His last publication, 67, said he doubted that Vietnam as a historical and cultural entity could survive under the attack of the largest military machine ever launched against an area this size. Mm. When he was writing that in a liberal city like Boston, you couldn't have a public demonstration because it would be broken up by Mm. students and others who were supporting the war. Took years of work in order to get to the point where you had mass public opposition, which finally had an effect. It's pretty good evidence that it prevented Nixon from going on to nuclear weapons as he was contemplating didn't end the. I, I can't imagine going to a pro-war rally myself, <laughs> or I just it's hard to put my mind into the minds of people. Well, that who might was, do that. That was the majority of the population, as late as the mid '60s. I recall I was living in Boston, mm. which is a very liberal city. As late as 1966, we couldn't even have a, a a meeting in a church without it being attacked by demonstrators, let alone on the public, in the Boston Common, the public place. And that's a bipartisan effort, is that right? That was bipartisan. Mm-hmm. The liberal Boston Globe, most liberal paper in the country, 1965, was praising the counter demonstrators for breaking up small anti-war demonstrations, Mm. a long time to switch. And in fact, liberal America never turns opposed to the war. If you look at the commentaries on the, at the war's end, 1975, everybody had to write something about the war and it ranged from what's called hawk to dove. You go to the dovish end of the extreme People like, say, Anthony Lewis, New York Times, probably the most outspoken public figure opposed to the war. His commentary was that the United States entered the Vietnam War with blundering efforts to do good. And by 1969, it was clear that it was a disaster. We couldn't bring democracy to South Vietnam at a cost acceptable to ourselves. I mean, that's 
so far yeah. to the right, you can't contemplate it. That was 1975. I should say at that time, polls showed that about 70% of the American population thought the war was not a mistake. It was fundamentally wrong and immoral, but you had practically no reflection of that opinion in public liberal commentary. So when you talk about preaching to the choir, there's a lot of preaching to do. And the same is true today. I wonder if you could comment on the importance of language in social change. It seems that the lack of even appropriate languaging and the huge well-funded propaganda machine that de demonizes any discussion of shared prosperity or collective good at every turn has left Americans without even a language to conceptualize an alternative to corporatism, imperialism, neoliberalism, and the like. Your thoughts about that? Well, the United States is an unusual society among developed societies. It's the only, I mean, the protection of freedom of speech is higher in the United States than any other country I know. On the other hand, uh, the use of freedom of speech is one of the lowest anywhere. Uh, take Bernie Sanders' programs. Uh, one of the uh, uh, leading columnists for the main business press in the world, the London Financial Times, Rana Farouhar, quipped, not entirely as a joke, that if Sanders was in Germany, he could be running on the conservative Christian Democrat program, which is correct. Take a look at his major programs, universal health care. Here it's described as too radical for the American public. Can't go that far. Can you think of any country that doesn't have universal health care? <laughs> I mean, take Germany. Yes, conservatives, of course, accept it. And in fact, just about every country accepts it. Mm -hmm. United States, it's too radical for the American population. Uh, take his word, he uses the word socialism. The United States is about the one country I know where that's a contentious word. Hmm. Almost everywhere else, say you're a socialist, to say like you're a Democrat. Hmm. It's not even a topic of discussion. Uh, the, uh, uh, the framework of debate and discussion here is very sharply skewed towards the right, while at the same time, in many ways, activism is more effective here. Mm. Many, the, the United States, though, despite these language uses, nevertheless pioneered modern social democracy. Mm. The New Deal in the 1930s was the most the real breakthrough into the kind of social democracy that developed in Europe after the Second World War. Hmm. then the United States has fallen far behind. This is very much a business-run society, and business carried out an intensive offensive to try to beat back the New Deal programs still going on. Public strongly supports them, but the legislative programs don't. They're very much under the influence of uh, the powerful, highly class-conscious business community. So it's a very complicated story. Actually, that leads us right into one of the things I wanted to ask you about the book. Um, in it, when talking again about the environment, you said the, and the quote is, the economic system is designed for suicide and that the leadership is happy to consign us to catastrophe for the benefit of short-term profit. Can you talk uh, about what you meant in terms of economic system designed for suicide, although it's not you know, too unclear, especially to our audience of activists. Um, but but also where the movement can be most effective in affecting change in this on this level. It's not, you know, a lot of this is private corporations. Um, it seems like an intractable and entrenched well, situation. Take, take private corporations. Uh, Milton Friedman is not my favorite person in the world. But he sometimes told the truth in uh, the beginning of the 
neoliberal age initiated mainly by Reagan and Thatcher, though they were precursors. Uh, it uh, adopted Friedman's uh, principle that the role of a corporation is to maximize profit. Anything else that the corporate management tries to do is improper, illegal, not their business. So here we have a system where, in, in fact, the structure of the neoliberal system, recall Reagan's inaugural address, that government is the problem, not the solution. Uh, government does make decisions. If you eliminate government from those decisions, the decisions don't go away. They're just transferred elsewhere to the private sector. So what he's saying is transfer decision making from government, which is to some extent responsive to the population, to private corporations, which have nothing, no commitment whatsoever, except to maximize their own profit. Well, what do you expect to happen from a system like that? Take uh, global warming. Why should a corporation uh, waste money trying to deal with the fact that uh, in 50 years it won't be a we won't survive? It's not their job. Their job is to make profit tomorrow. Mm. So, and it continues. By now, public pressure has been so extreme that even the major fossil fuel companies are saying, yes, we understand we're responsible citizens, trust us, we're going to work on global warming. So you look at Exxon Mobil's program, uh, very nice words, we agree with you, terrible problem, let's work on it, then look at their proposals. Maximize the use of fossil fuels and invest in futuristic technologies which may someday be able to remove some of the poisons from the atmosphere that we're pouring into them. It's mm -hmm. called greenwashing. Those are the programs. Well, okay, that's what you expect on the basis of a private uh, tyranny, which is what a corporation is, which is committed to maximizing profit, uh, management salaries, CEO salaries, and so on. That's its job. That's what it's going to do. Why is the system a suicide pact? Because that's what it's based on. Mm. Uh, that has to be, can be controlled, can be contained, but not if you eliminate the regulatory apparatus, not if you allow the corporate system free reign. That's the neoliberal programs, and it's been very harmful. Uh, let's take the Republicans and global warming. Why did that happen? Uh, why did they become a party of denialists? Was it always? It was not always true. In fact, you don't have to go very far back to find when it wasn't true. 2008, John McCain ran for president on the Republican ticket. He had a minor climate change plank in his platform. Something wasn't wonderful, but it was at least something recognized the problem. The uh, Republican Congress was beginning to consider things like a carbon tax, some mild moves. The Koch brothers, energy conglomerate, huge conglomerate, which had been working for years to try to make sure that the Republicans were totally denialist, they went into action launched a huge juggernaut, uh, bribing senators, uh, threatening them with primary challenges, uh, huge lobbying campaign, major astroturf campaign, Republican Party leadership switched on a dime. They became denialists. Mm. Forget all this nonsense about trying to save the environment. You go to the last event where Republican leaders could actually talk the 2016 primary. After that, they're all terrified of Trump, but 2016 primary, they could still talk for themselves. Uh, every, in the Republican primary, every single candidate 
either denied that climate change was taking place or said, maybe it is, but we don't care. The one who was considered the adult in the room, you know, uh, applauded by progressives, John Kasich, applauded so much that he was invited to speak at the 2020 Democratic Convention, the liberal hero. He was the worst of all of them. What he said is, yes, uh, humans are uh, responsible for climate change, but we in Ohio are going to use our coal and not apologize for it. Aye. That's <laughs> progressive in the uh, in, among the Republican Party. And it traces back to 2008, 2009, when the Koch brothers, juggernaut, switched the party. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the same on other issues, I should say. Take, say, abortion. By now, that's... Uh, if you're a Republican, you have to say no abortion. Where'd that come from? Well, 19, around 1975, a Republican strategist Paul Weyrich, himself a Christian nationalist, uh, recognized and convinced the party that if they pretended, I stress pretended, to be uh, anti-abortion, they could pick up the evangelical vote and the Northern Catholic vote. They all switched. Reagan had been strongly pro-choice. Uh, when he was governor of California in the 60s, he passed a strong legislation supporting abortion rights. George H.W. Bush, pro-choice, you know. Well, they didn't use the word then, but that's what it meant. And uh, after virus insight, they all switched. Now it's a plank, a solid plank of the Republican Party. I mean, the corruption behind all of this is mind-boggling, but it works. It's a way of mobilizing people to vote against their own interests. You have to recognize the Republican Party has a real problem. They are of the two political parties. They are the one that's more supportive of wealth and corporate power. Actually, the differences are not great, but they're there. Uh, you can't go to voters and say, uh, I want to stab you in the back. Please vote for me. So therefore, they have to conceal their policies. They don't talk about the legislative programs. What you do is shift to what are called cultural issues, guns, abortion, no religion, anything but policy, mm -hmm. then you can mobilize people. And the Republicans are almost forced to do that. Democrats also do to an extent, but for the Republicans, it's a necessity. You cannot come to the voters with your actual policies. Trump could not come to the voters and say, my main policy is a tax scam that stabs you in the back and enriches the rich, vote for me. That doesn't work. Even half of the Americans who were uh, blind enough to not be aware that climate chaos is upon us uh, would maybe not be blind enough to still vote for him if he had come out and said that actual his actual policy. Um, Professor Chomsky, in your chapter 11 of Chomsky for Activists, you discuss the movement and third parties and the importance of starting inroads at the local level. This past Tuesday in Buffalo, New York, America's third poorest mid-sized city, India Walton, a Democratic Socialist, beat the longtime Democratic Party incumbent in the mayoral primary, and that means she's most certainly going to be the mayor there. Um, what does her election mean for the trajectory of the movement? Well, I think thinking about an actual party, political party that has is committed to the public welfare, the common good. That's a great idea. It's very difficult to do in the American system. We have a very regressive political system. In the 18th century, the uh, American revolution, so-called, had progressive aspects. The Constitution itself is a very conservative document. It was 
aim the founders wanted to restrict and limit democracy still by the standards of the 18th century was a step forward but being wedded to that system 250 years later it actually makes very little sense <laughs> the idea that the i mean the ideal for the judicial system is what's called originalism we have to figure out what a small group of wealthy white slave owners had in mind when they put this into the constitution that's surreal mm. if uh, the united states tried to enter the european union it would probably be turned down by the european court of justice because the system is so regressive uh in many ways um, this character the nature of the senate uh, many other things so it's hard to do it's hard to break through but not impossible and it's very interesting that there have been significant efforts which should be better known so take the environmental movement it's forgotten mostly that the one of the leading figures in the environmental movement was tony mazaki high official of the union of uh, oil chemical and atomic workers that union was in the forefront of pressing on environmental issues back in the early 70s when almost nobody was talking about it and uh, mazaki was also pretty critical of capitalism he thought that workers ought to have control over businesses in the 1990s he started a labor party well, at that point, the unions were under such brutal attack, mm. bipartisan attack, that there wasn't a solid basis for it. But with the revival of the labor movement, which is by no means impossible and is very important, you could have a labor based party of the kind that Mazaki had in mind, which could become a major factor in the political system because of the regressive nature of the political system first past the post and so on it's pretty hard to do but there are ways of working into it like the working party in uh, new york we yes. can working families fusion yeah. candidates and so on so there are possibilities professor Occupy Wall Street is having its 10-year anniversary this year. In fact, this organization, ACT TV, came out of the Occupy movement. Would you comment on that movement, its importance, and any enduring legacy you see? The, Act, the Occupy movement was extremely successful. It's always called a failure, but that's a misunderstanding. Occupy was a tactic. It was not a strategy. You can't sit in Zuccotti Park forever. It was a tactic that had enormous success. It shifted discourse and thinking radically. It brought into the center of public attention for the first time, the critical issue of radical inequality. David Graeber's, late David Graeber's slogan, one, we're the 99% that resonated and it made a big difference all across the board changed what's sometimes called the overton window what you can talk about now the occupy movement tried hard to move on to other kinds of activities neighborhood organizing and so on some success some failure but uh, there was a lasting impact. You're one example of it, many others. Okay, so I would say that's one of the more successful movements in modern American history, changed things enormously. Uh, the tactic, of course, couldn't go on forever. It was a short term tactic, hmm. which it also introduced concepts of solidarity and mutual support which was a major breakthrough in changing understanding and consciousness. We can work together. We can have our own soup kitchens. We can support each other. Okay. That's a very important 
understanding in a society where the doctrinal system is working overtime to convince you that you have to be out for yourself and not pay attention to anyone else. That's what we're indoctrinated in from childhood. So just breaking through and saying, no, that's not true. We can work together for the common good, big effect and a lasting effect. So I think it was a very successful movement. Professor Chomsky, one of your chapters is 100 Seconds to Midnight. When you were an activist in the 60s or throughout your career, did you think it was going to come to this, that we would have a Trump, that we would be facing possible extinction? In the early 60s, there was deep concern over the threat of nuclear war and nuclear destruction. You know, I had friends, uh, liberal activist friends, who went to New Zealand because that's the only way they could save themselves from the coming nuclear war. There was enormous concern just about radiation. We had little kids at the time. We didn't give them milk, only powdered milk, because there was, and that was a realistic concern. The uh, effects of nuclear testing were causing enormous radiation problems, uh, which had a sharp effect. Young people in the early 60s, many of them felt, what's the point of living? It's all going to be destroyed by a nuclear war. I remember this vividly. So yes, the fear of destruction is nothing new. Now it happens to be much more realistic. Both, there was very little concern about environment in the 60s, almost none. When Tony Mazaki and others got engaged in the early 70s, it was so exotic, people didn't even notice it. But, uh, and of course, notice that made sense for the oil and chemical and atomic workers union. They're the ones who are on the forefront. They're the ones who are suffering from the effects of the serious lethal effects of pollution and so on. So for them to be involved was not strange, nor is it strange now that the mine workers and others are beginning to join seriously in the movement to control the disaster. But uh, we now face problems that weren't understood at the time. In the last 20, 30 years, we've finally come to understand what a few people were talking about before, that uh, uh, the climate destruction is an imminent problem and one of overwhelming significance along with nuclear war. It's not being discussed anywhere near enough. Uh, you take a look at uh, the charges against Trump and the liberal media, you, anything you can think of, not the fact that he was racing to destroy the environment mm -hmm. or that he dismantled the entire arms control regime which somewhat limited the threat of nuclear war, didn't come up in the convention. It's not talked about. It's only the most important question in human history. Uh, that has to change. Finally, Professor Chomsky, in your years of teaching, you must have had students from the other side of the aisle, the other side of the spectrum. I'm curious if you have any experiences that stand out to you when you know, being an educator to students who really come from a different political background. I mean, I was teaching at MIT most of my life. Uh, MIT was a pretty conservative place until the late 60s. Late 60s, it changed radically under the effect of a small group of students who really over changed everything there. It was very striking what they did. But the student body was quite conservative engineers. They didn't care much about things. Uh, right now, I'm teaching at a state university. Arizona has the lowest per capita expenditures for education in the country. I think maybe Mississippi is even lower, but way down. A very The legislator is extraordinarily right wing. Uh, I, I give courses on 
what we're now talking about. I talk just like this to freshman courses, students who've never heard any of this before. Uh, they're interested and they think about it. They, there's disagreements, there should be you know, challenging assumptions they've made all their life, but perfectly reasonable discussions, many of them become engaged and active. Okay, that's always happened. And, uh, you know, especially younger people who are less indoctrinated uh, are open to discussion. You see, even see it in polls. Take what I said about the Republican Party and climate denial. If you look at it through the age range, it differs. Among younger Republicans, not enough, but maybe a third uh, break with the party and recognize that it's a serious problem. Mm. Even among younger evangelicals, there's a shift, more openness. That's a hopeful sign for the future. It's going to be very hard to convince older people who've been immersed in a particular doctrine all their lives to question and change it. Can be done, but it's not easy. But younger people are much more open, are changing. That's why it's the youth movements that are in the forefront of all the activism. When Greta Thunberg stood up at the Davos meeting and turned to the audience and said, you have betrayed us, she was right. It's the older generation that has betrayed us. And the younger generation is taking the lead and trying to do something about it, which is a tragedy. We should be. But, uh, and that can change. Professor Chomsky, I thank you so much for being on the program. Thank you for all the um, work you have done in the name of peace and justice. I encourage everyone to go out and get the new book, Chomsky, for activists. Not only is Professor Chomsky um, interviewed in there and, and has pieces written, but there are other activists who have worked with Professor Chomsky throughout the years uh, talking about their experience. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you being here. Thank you for what you're doing. Mm -hmm. It's crucial. You're watching Act TV.